Welcome to another episode of Pituitary Grand Rounds. This informative discussion focuses on the issues that result when surgery involves the cavernous sinus. Things have changed and things always evolve and change and the, the latest frontier is surgery in the cavernous sinus. And I've known each and every one of you to go into the cavernous sinus to remove tumor when you thought it was safe and reasonable to do so. But other surgeons are now removing the leaflets of the cavernous sinus, the, the lateral walls of the cella on a routine basis, especially for patients with large tumors. So I wanna talk about that approach, what the uh, potential problems with, and, and the, the benefits as well. So Sandeep. Really, um, the one reason why we should or should not cure a tumor is if there's involvement of the cavernous sinus. And then we're talking about pituitary tumors. It's very different than meningiomas or craniopharyngiomas. And the cavernous sinus has always been a problem for us because the carotid artery is there. Uh, it's a blood-filled sinus, and so once you start opening it up, you fill it up with blood, and you don't see very well. And then, of course, the cranial nerves are there, the third, fourth, sixth cranial nerves. So you're risking diplopia that could be very devastating for patients when they're driving and doing activities. And of course, the carotid artery is the biggest concern is stroke, and that's something we can never really tolerate for these patients. And and I've been fortunate in the last uh, 28 years of over almost 3,000 surgeries, we have not a carotid injury. And that's partly because of experience and partly because of understanding anatomy, but definitely it's a complication that can happen. So the question then is, is balancing this risk-benefit ratio is, is for endocrine inactive or non-functioning adenomas, if there's involvement of the cavernous sinus, if it's soft, we can easily dissect it off. We'll take off the tumor above and below the carotid, but typically I don't go lateral to the carotid because that's when the risks start to go up. And for a non-functioning adenoma, whether you take out 95% or 98% or 99%, really there's no huge value because you're always, my philosophy, and this has been shown in the long-term follow-up of these tumors, if there's cavernous sinus invasion, you may get a higher chance of remission, but you're not getting a higher chance of cure because even if you leave microscopic disease behind, you saw how we got those clear planes being developed. We saw the margins. You never can do that in the cavernous sinus. It's always going to be, it's a very irregular structure. There's nooks and crannies there. You're working around the carotid and around the nerves. So there's always a chance of leaving microscopic disease behind. And yes, the MRI scans look good right away. And yes, the hormone levels may look better for hormonally active tumors where we are more aggressive for hormonally active tumors. In my mind, not to cure the tumor, but if we can safely go in the cavernous sinus and debulk as much tumor as possible, sometimes I will remove the leaflet of the cavernous sinus wall if it's involved. Because again, the goal is to try to get the hormones, the IGF-1 normal, the cortisol levels uh, normal, um, but knowing that's only temporary, it's remission. Because then the key thing you have to keep in mind is we have a backup solution. These aren't malignant tumors. These are benign tumors. And we have what's called stereotactic radiosurgery. At UCSF, we've got all the machines, CyberKnife, TrueBeam, and GammaKnife. Typically for the pituitary, we use GammaKnife. But with GammaKnife radiosurgery, we have to keep in mind we have submillimeter accuracy in, in targeting. So we can outline the cavernous wall. We can outline the entire cavernous sinus. Remember, this is the opposite side of the pituitary gland and stalk, so we can treat that area, as long as we know we've cleaned everything else out, treat that area with really a less than 1% risk of damage in the gland, optic nerve, or brain tissue. And so really, it's actually much safer than surgery. It's the safest procedure we have, and that'll, that's curative. You know, We know that the majority of cases, 90% to 95 to 98% chance, we can cure the tumors involving the cavernous sinus. So now you have that balancing game, right, of, of, of is it worth a 1% risk of carotid injury, opening that up, when you've got gamma knife that has a 90% cure rate with a 0% risk of damaging the artery? Doesn't make sense to me. Again, you gotta do what's best for the patient, not what's best for your records and what your MRI scans are in the short term, long term. The one thing gamma knife does not do well is bring down hormone levels. It's a very delayed process. So that's why we do go into the cavernous sinus to debulk it. I'd rather gamma knife a patient with an IGF-1 level of 400 because I think, yes, we will get cure eventually. It's a slow process. It takes three to six years. I don't want to gamma knife someone with an IGF-1 of, of 1,000 because I know 10 years later, they're still going to have a high IGF-1 level. We'll need to do medical therapy or other options in that situation. So those are the reasons, yes, that makes sense to go in the cavernous sinus, but again, not to try to cure them. Routinely doing them makes no, has no value because, again, if we had no other option, if it was surgery and then if it came back, we had to do surgery again, then maybe that could justify that higher risk. Again, even a 1% risk and actually it's 3% risk right now for uh, uh, diplopia, it's hard to sort of understand when you have another procedure that has a 0% risk that has a higher cure rate long term. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think um, the technology has evolved to where even if you enter the cavernous sinus during surgery, 
your risk of uh, arterial injury is is very low. We have a lot of tools. Um, we can inject fluorescent dyes uh, intravenously that label the carotid artery very clearly. We can use ultrasound to warn us when we're very close. Um, but then what uh, is even harder to control is the cranial nerves. And although they are at the lateral component of the cavernous sinus, um, nerves are not sort of all or nothing the way an artery is. A nerve can undergo some mechanical stretch um, from irritation, even if you're not anywhere near it. Um, and a nerve can under, undergo, experience some sort of thermal injury if you're you know, working with uh, heat. And, and there's just a variety of components that are harder to control for. And so if you look at the most experienced centers with cavernous sinus surgery for pituitary tumors, they report um, six to 10% incidence of cranial neuropathies after um, surgery in the cavernous sinus. And I think that's starting to get to the point where you have to weigh a risk, you know, double vision, which is clearly a, a debilitating thing and limits your ability to do your job and, and see binocularly and uh, for the patient. And you have to weigh that risk versus um, the option of uh, leaving behind a little bit of residual and treating it with radiosurgery, SND polluted to. And so, while there are definitely cases where the tumor leads you into the cavernous sinus and, and you're able to achieve um, a meaningful cytoreductive element or even in some cases a gross total resection, I would say, you know, to routinely remove the cavernous sinus wall without a clear indication to do so would be, um, in my opinion, crossing the boundary from sort of safe surgery for a benign tumor into something that if I were the patient would carry um, slightly more risk than I'd feel comfortable with. Dr. Goldsmith. Um, so I kind of saw this being born in Pittsburgh. Um, so during my training, the two main surgeons uh, switched from not taking the middle of cavernous sinus to doing so. Um, I must say that even those surgeons will say that increases the technical skills that need to perform the surgery by a thousand because it goes from what we call level two pituitary surgery from level four vascular surgery. So it's a lot harder. Because it's a lot harder, you need to perform a lot more of these to make it safe. Um, and this is a little bit, you know, when I see, you know, Mike Lawton saying what, what, you know, what are his results, but those are not the results of clipping aneurysms. They're the result of Mike Lawton clipping an aneurysm. So I think, my take home message for me was like, this is how someone else is doing this, someone that's doing a lot of this. And as trainees, we choose then, okay, what I'm gonna do with this? And I don't replicate that just because of this, because I agree with what, uh, you know, Sandeep and Manish said, that is that, well, I'm not safer than the gamma knife machine. That's not to be said that someone else might be, I'm not, and I always choose safety, and it's a pretty easy conclusion for, for me, and it's one of the decisions that we make once we start our own practice. Am I gonna do the same thing or not, and just taking the tools that we like and, and applying them. So, Tarun, uh, your comments, but let me ask you a question. What would you tell a patient who said, I wanna go see the person who does this operation, why, why should I stay with you instead of go have that operation done? First of all, it, it, the most important thing is the relationship between the, the surgeon and the group as, and the patient and setting reasonable expectations. We've all had patients come to us and, and go from us. And you have to, as hard as it is, take your ego out of it. But, but at the same time, you need to be honest uh, with them um, and just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it right and you always have to remember that and uh, I think early in one's career you know coming out of training you see all these high-end things and you're thinking oh I can do that because I've done you know X number with so and so and and then you get in there and you have a complication and you you never forget you never sleep easy. The next, it haunts you every surgery. And um, I think, the, as Sandeep alluded to, the further you get into your career, the more humble you get. And you realize that 
these are benign tumors, the patient is living with that complication. You as a surgeon, from a purely selfish standpoint, are living with that complication too, right? So um, I wouldn't want to have diplopia if I didn't need to. If I needed to, okay. Um, if somebody said that they want to go to that surgeon, I have to be okay with that and, and allow them to make their decision. You know, it, it's it, the older generation of surgeons was very much the dogmatic surgeon. You need to have this. This is the way you, you, you should have it done. I have to take out all of the glioma. It, it, and now there's more of a shared decision making. I think it needs to be a guided decision making. I think you can't just you know put a contract in front of a patient's f face with numbers on it and say you choose. You have to guide them in your own philosophy, and that's where the difference between surgeons, uh, I think, comes up is sort of that philosophy you bring to that relationship. Um, the philosophy I think all of us bring is yes, we can do it but we don't always have to and stop uh, because you have to remember all the other tools you have. You have some of these newer medications, you have gamma knife, you have these things and there's always the chance to come back later, right? If I leave some and it's critical that I come back soon thereafter, okay. But if I go in and get everything out but I've caused a stroke or permanent diplopia, there's no going back. So. I think those are sort of the, the key points from my perspective. One of the things that I tell all of our patients is that it requires a surgeon with good judgment. And that's not only intraoperative judgment to decide when the operation's done, when they should continue, what a structure might be before they cut it, for example. But also good surgical planning and good post-operative care. And it's one of the things I've appreciated working with you gentlemen at UCSF is that you all have great judgment. And I think that's the key to successful surgery, regardless of which tool we employ. And, it, and it's going to lead the best outcomes in patients that are satisfied with the care that they receive. I hope you all have a, a, a pretty good idea of the type of work that we do at UCSF. I'm, I'm very fortunate to work with these gentlemen and, and I tell my patients whatever outcome you get is the best you're going to get. You know, we can't do better than this and I don't think you can go anywhere else and do better uh, than the outcomes that we can offer at UCSF. So I really appreciate you folks sharing with us your perspectives on these different types of operations. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for this episode of Pituitary Grand Rounds. Have a good day. I'm Jorge Fascinetti, Pituitary World News co-founder. I want to take this time to thank you for watching this educational program exclusively produced by Pituitary World News. We are also deeply grateful for your support. To donate and continue to be a part of our mission, please visit us at pituitaryworldnews.org.